for the last 15 years, I've had a chance to be part of developing self-driving cars and, uh, and seen that kind of from the front row. And so today I was going to talk to you a little bit about my experience over that time, um, a little bit about uh, what we're doing at Aurora, uh, and a little bit about kind of where I see this going and some of the challenges we face as an industry. So for me, this started in 2003. Um, this was a, rob a robot I had the chance to work on uh, out in the Atacama Desert, and it drove at 15 centimeters a second, which is about this fast. Um, and my PhD advisor, Red Whitaker, came down and said, we're going to go and build a robot for the DARPA Challenge, and it's going to drive at 50 miles an hour across the desert. And to me, that just sounded cool. Um, and, uh, and the fact that we'd actually get something that really moved would be, be a heck of a lot of fun. And so we, we got started, and we didn't really know what we were doing, so we started with a Humvee because we figured that could drive over pretty much anything, and that would make the problem easier. Uh, we cut the top off of it, put some electronics on it, um, lasers, radar, there's cameras hidden in here. Um, and, and actually, we gave it maps ahead of time to help drive. And so when I look back at this now, you know, almost 14 years ago or 15 years ago, um, it really is kind of like the, one of the missing links in the self-driving kind of history, right? It was the first time where we pulled all of those different disparate technologies into a vehicle and set it loose in the world. And we tested it really hard. Um, <laughs> so this was 10 days before the first competition. Um, this was the day that I got beeped on the History Channel. Um, and if you've ever wondered what it looks like when you roll a self-driving vehicle, uh, this is a onboard robot view. But we got the vehicle pulled back together. We got it through the qualification events that DARPA had for this 150-mile race across the desert. And we went about seven miles into the race. Um, and this was the vehicle. It came around this corner. It was a little tight, got over the edge, got on the berm, um, almost literally burst into flames uh, and stopped there, um, which was not great for us. It was good for the guys behind us because we drove through um, you know, three fence posts on the way, and they had a much smaller vehicle, uh, and so they would not have uh, made it quite so far without us. Um, but for the day, you know, we, we were pretty sad until we started to look back on it and realize that while we only went seven and a bit miles of the 150, um, we did get up to 40 miles an hour for parts of that, right? And we had this thing we created head off into the desert and all by itself. And so that was pretty exciting, and the Defense Department kind of you know, looked on it and said, yeah, okay, why don't you guys come back another year and see how it goes? And so we did. <laughs> um, and this was really my education that move fast and break things is not really the right answer in the self-driving car space. Uh, but once again, we got the vehicles put back together. And this year, five vehicles actually finished what was this grand challenge. And the team from Stanford finished first. The two red vehicles from Carnegie Mellon came second and third. Um, we were sad, they were happy, but it was kind of a big day for the field, right? That we'd actually moved past what this was this challenge, right? We drove across the desert with not a whole lot of stuff, well, actually nothing moving in it, uh, and we're able to, you know, get to the finish line. DARPA said, that's nice, but why don't you come back when we can drive in traffic? And so they say it came up with the urban challenge. This is kind of the, the heart of the problem that we face in self-driving today. So. The MIT vehicle comes, into the, comes out of this entry where the white car is there. It sees the black vehicle parked on the side of the road. It thinks, I know what's going to happen next. He's going to sit there. I'll just drive around and keep going. And partway through that, the Cornell vehicle moves. And so anticipating what the other actors on the road are going to do is really one of the hardest problems we're trying to solve today, that kind of intent question. At the end of the day, um, though, six vehicles actually finished it. They pried the MIT Cornell vehicles apart. They continued on their way and finished. Stanford, Carnegie Mellon, Virginia Tech all finished as well. And so we were able to kind of look back at this and say this was a, a big day for self-driving cars, right? We'd actually got vehicles driving in traffic amongst, one, amongst themselves. And then basically the government said, problem solved. At least DARPA did. Um, go and figure out how to bring this to market yourselves. And so in 2009, I got invited to Google to uh, lead engineering for the self-driving car program there. And at this time, this was pre-Android and pre-really YouTube being a thing, and Google was a search engine company. But the two founders had this vision that they'd built an incredible engineering organization, and they should turn that to solve important problems in the world. And one of the important problems they turned it towards was self-driving cars. 
And so we started with the objective to try to prove to ourselves we could actually do something with the technology on real roads. And so we set two goals, drive 100,000 miles on public roads, and then drive 1,000 miles of really interesting roads. And the long story short is within two years, we actually were able to check those objectives off. You know, it was a, an order of magnitude more than anyone had done before. Uh, and convince ourselves there was a business to be built here. And so we tried to figure out how to build that business. Along the way, we discovered a lot of interesting things so, and, and had a bunch of world's firsts. So this was the first time a self-driving car got pulled over by a policeman. Um, and it turns out that the kind of the lesson to learn from this is that the relationships with the community actually really matter. Right? This is not just a technology, it's not just a business, but it's part of our, our, kind of our social fabric. And you know, the story was that he pulled us over because the vehicle was obstructing traffic and slowing it down. We looked at the data, there were no cars behind it. The guy was just curious, right? He just wanted to know about the technology. And so we were able to, you know, this was really you know, an important lesson for me about the importance of bringing the community along, bringing all the stakeholders along with us. And then we had another world's first, which was, this is Steve Mann. Turns out he's blind. Uh, and we were able to give him a ride through uh, an Austin neighborhood with nobody else in the car and give him a taste of the freedom that this technology will bring. Uh, and that was kind of a profound moment, right? This was a, a watershed where somebody was able to get in a vehicle, drive along a public road. Um, you know, this, I remember watching the video stream from a car, and there was a woman pushing a baby carriage down the side of the road. Right? This was the real world. And we'd done enough on the safety uh, arguments around this to be confident to put it out in the world. Uh, and so that was a big day for me and, and you know, kind of the culmination of, of my career with Google. Over the last few years, we've been, uh, in, it's been incredibly exciting to see kind of the birth of an industry around this, whether it be the giant tech companies, uh, the automotive companies, and obviously a bunch of startups as well. And for, for me, this has always really been about, uh, one, doing something cool and exciting and fun, but also the massive social uh, impact that this can have in the world, right? This is what drives our team at Aurora. This is what drives us a lot of time at Waymo. And we think about the opportunity to save 140 lives a day, right? We think about the fact that 6 million people don't have access to transportation that they should, and that by giving, bringing this technology to market, we can enable them to have the mobility that we all take for granted. We think about the idea of giving people back two weeks a year of their life, right? That's profound. Um, the fact that when they could get home from work at the end of the day, instead of having you know, spent that, you know, the last half hour cursing about somebody cutting them off and being stuck in traffic, they could have been reading a book or finishing their email or having a nap and get home and happy uh, and be happy with their family. And then ultimately the opportunity to revitalize cities and take back what is sometimes, you know, something like a third of the city and turn that into other usable space. And so this is, this is kind of the promise of where this technology can go. And that brings us to Aurora. Uh, this is a company that uh, three of us founded a little over a year and a half ago. And it started with, like I said, the three of us. So this is uh, Sterling Anderson. He's, a, he's an MIT PhD. I don't hold that against him. Um, uh, he spent a couple years at McKinsey. Uh, and then he was at Tesla and helped launch Autopilot there and Model X. And so he sort of understands what it takes to move, product in the, uh, move pro technology to product in the automotive space. And the gentleman on, on the left here is Drew Bagnell. He and I have known each other for going on 20 years. We went to grad school together. Um, uh, he's one of the world's experts in machine learning applied to robotics, and in particular, machine learning applied to robotics and, and motion planning. Uh, and so between the three of us, my experience uh, in self-driving cars, Sterling's experience um, actually shipping product, and Drew's experience in machine learning, we thought we had a foundation to go build a company that could accelerate the adoption of this technology and work with the automotive industry and work with other stakeholders to bring it to market. And then over the years, we, over the year and a bit, we've built an amazing team. We're 180 something people or 180 people at this point. And we have a, a ton of great people that have worked on the challenges, worked with car companies. Our VP of software engineer used to be the VP of software engineering at uh, SpaceX. So he's landed rockets which is mind-blowing, um, all kinds of cool backgrounds that we've been able to bring together that are united in this mission of delivering the benefits of self-driving technology. And what are we building? 
Uh, well, we're building the hardware systems. We're designing the hardware systems, so the sensors uh, and compute that actually operate on the vehicle, the software that actually takes that data and understands how to drive the vehicle safely, and then the data, like the maps that are necessary to, to operate. Our architecture is based around maps to begin with. Uh, so we understand computers are really good at pulling data together and accessing it quickly. Maps are a way, just one representation of data we can provide to the vehicle. From those maps, we can understand where the vehicle is precisely in the world. So this is called localization. At Aurora, this, we were able to do this to about 10 centimeter resolution, but not just in X and Y, but also in a few, a few millirads of <coughs> orientation as well. So we can understand in six degrees of freedom precisely where the vehicle is. Uh, we then have a perception system. This is taking the data from the sensors, figuring out the actors are on the, on the road around us. A planning system that reacts to those, and then the control that turns that into the actuation of the vehicle. And of course, there's a bunch more stuff that goes into this. And every time I show this graphic, our CTO Drew tells me it's completely wrong, um, but you know, it's, it's approximately correct for, for how the system works. Uh, and so let me talk about different parts of this. So when we talk about mapping, there's kind of different components of that. So mapping here, what you're looking at is the vector representation of the world. So you can see the lane markings that, uh, and road boundaries and the geometry that they, that they express. The interconnectivity here, so the, uh, the fact that these are a, an open lane change. Underlying that is a, a detailed 3D representation of the world. And then behind that even, is a, a different representation we use for localization. So each of the little speckles on here is actually a 3D surface panel that is allowing us, it's a few, or a few tens of centimeters in diameter that allows us to match the laser data in real time with it. And this is what allows us to get that localization result. We don't believe you can solve this with any one sensing modality by itself. Uh, we think that each of the different sensors that we could use, laser radar and camera in particular, are going to fail in different ways, and that's super valuable for us. And this is illustrative of that. So in the video, or the, the image at the top here, this is just the, one of the cameras we have on the vehicle. And they're quality automotive cameras with reasonably high dynamic range. Uh, and what you can see is it's actually very hard as a person to pick out the cyclist over here. Right? So the fact that these are passive sensors means that it's, you know, uh, we have limitations in what we can perceive in the world. Obviously, a LiDAR that's actively illuminating that can solve the problem. Uh, similarly, here's a radar. This is driving through a tunnel in Pittsburgh, and this purple stuff in front of us is multi-path reflection uh, off of the tunnel and various noise in it. And so we have to be able to filter that out from the true things that are in the tunnel, the other vehicles. So if we just trusted the radar there, we'd be in a world of trouble. And then finally, over here in the bottom, uh, this is a LiDAR data, and this is our car driving through a snowstorm. Uh, and what you can see is there's a cloud of fuzz around the vehicle, which is energy reflecting off the snow in the air. And so we have to be able to deal with that and other visual obscurants in the air that are going to reflect back that energy. And so the vehicle, by combining these different modes, obviously the camera can see through most of the snow. The radar can certainly see through the snow. The laser doesn't have the same multipath problems in the tunnel, nor does the camera. By combining these elements together, we're actually able to build a system that's relatively robust. A second example is the fact that we don't really have religion about the engineering approach to use. So we look at machine learning and we believe that's an incredibly valuable tool to have in our toolbox, but it's not the be all and end all. You know, there's been an incredible amount of work in patient filtering, there's all kinds of good other algorithmic work, and we need to unite the two of them to actually build a system that, that will ultimately work. And so what you're looking at here is at the bottom, this is uh, the raw detections from our machine learning system. And they're pretty good, but they're pretty jumpy and jerky. It turns out that this is the best way that we can pull signal out of the camera and laser data. But once we get that signal, we can pass it through classic Bayesian filtering techniques and we can get results at the top that actually very robustly and accurately reflect the world. And so by using both approaches, we're actually able to build something that could conceivably work. Similarly, uh, our detection system might flag these vehicles along the side of the road but it's just going to, it might just give them kind of a generic volume. So, you know, a car is roughly this big. Uh, it turns out that's, that's at least at the heart of how our, our system works. Once we've got those detections, we can then over time refine the estimates of the boundary of those vehicles, again, using various Bayesian techniques, and get something that actually represents tightly the, the bounding box of those vehicles. And that obviously matters as you start to drive through narrow roads on, in, in urban areas. 
And this is a, a couple of other interesting examples. So this is the vehicle making a left turn at a large intersection. You can see we're tracking a bunch of vehicles. And as we move forward here, uh, understand the state of the traffic light, and then track the dozens of vehicles that are around us on the road. On the right here, this is particularly interesting. This is a motorcycle lane splitting. Uh, and what's unique about the way we're solving this problem is it doesn't really matter to us how close that motorcycle gets to other vehicles on the road. We're still able to pull them out from the, from the neighboring vehicles and track them robustly. And this is just fun. Um, so we had a bunch of people at, at work that ride bicycles come play around one of our cars in the parking lot uh, and track them. Uh, and then you know, took some drone footage and created a cute video. But this can get, kind of give you the, uh, the, the sense for the ability of the system to perceive all the way around it and track robustly, even in weird situations. So I'm going to turn to planning. And these would have been much better with videos. That's also going to be a video. Um, motion planning is one of those things where you actually see the humanness of the drivers, right? It's a very social interaction. Um, when you come to an intersection, there are generally relatively subtle cues that you use to figure out whether it's your turn to go or not, uh, and what the right social action is. Like you can spend months and months uh, as a team tuning parameters to make this work. At Aurora, one of the cores of our approaches has been to apply machine learning to the problem, uh, and so that we can then refine that using just data and obs observation of human drivers on the road. And so what you would see here is a couple of cases where uh, we're dealing with relatively complicated intersections that we haven't seen before. Uh, the vehicle would drive through them and drive robustly. This is another example of social driving. So um, this is merging onto the 280 freeway. Our vehicle is coming from the on-ramp, and it's accelerating from 0 to 55 or, or 65 miles per hour in this case. And it looks across to the freeway beside it and has to reason about, should it fit in front of this vehicle? Should it fit between these vehicles? Or should it slow down and fall behind those vehicles? Uh, it turns out that's actually a relatively subtle decision. And if you get it wrong, it feels incredibly uncomfortable, both for you and for the other drivers on the road. And so by observing uh, human driving, we're actually able to refine uh, the right and, and figure out what the decision boundaries are appropriately to do this uh, and come up with realistic driving or human-like driving. So that's a little bit about the technology and some of the ways we're approaching it, Aurora. Let me talk a little bit about the challenges we're facing. And so one of them is the perception of self-driving technology. So this is kind of the canonical um, way, at least in California, self-driving cars get into an accident. Uh, and this is normally a video I would play. But what happens is a lead vehicle comes to a stop, some other vehicle comes to a stop, a self-driving car comes to a stop in a perfectly reasonable way, and then somebody crashes into the back of them. Uh, and in this vehicle, in, in this video, the third vehicle doesn't even slow down, just crashes into the back of it. So there's kind of this myth out there that self-driving cars behave weirdly, and that results in accidents. I think what we're actually seeing in California with the reporting system that we have is first time a true kind of insight into the rate that these accidents happen on the road. Um, through my time at, at Google, there was really only one event uh, where we thought that the self-driving car really was kind of engaged in the act of causing the accident. Um, and this was the engagement, uh, the, the event that happened between one of the self-driving Lexuses and a bus. Uh, and what happened in this situation is the car was on the side of the road intending to make a right turn. It was using a very wide lane and using the right half of it. As it got close to the, in, uh, close to the intersection, there was a pile of sandbags in the road. And it saw them and decided it had to go nudge into traffic to go around them. It looked back at the traffic that was coming, looked at the lane width, and it saw a bus. And it said, you know, it analyzed the situation and said the bus could not fit past it. Thus, the bus will slow down. Thus, I should you know, I have room to pull out in front of the bus and, and go around these sandbags. The bus driver looked at the situation and said, I can make it, right? Uh, and, and I don't think he was necessarily wrong. Um, but so he went, and the self-driving car kind of pulled. And at about two miles per hour, the two um, traded sheet metal. Uh, and so this goes back to that point that I made earlier about the Caltech, or sorry, about um, MIT and Cornell, right? Understanding and estimating the behavior of other drivers on the road 
is a fundamental part of the challenge we face. It's really, if we could snap our fingers today and move the human-driven traffic up the road, the self-driving car problem would be a much, much easier problem. Obviously, that's impractical. This is another example of the challenge with uh, estimating and understanding kind of human norms. So this was one of the Uber accidents in Pasadena, not the, or sorry, in Phoenix, not the fatal accident, but one where an Uber vehicle ended up on its side. Um, in this situation, what was happening, there was two lanes of stopped traffic, a third lane with free-flowing traffic. The Uber vehicle was proceeding at the speed limit. Um, by law, you know, doing a reasonable thing. Uh, there was a vehicle that was attempting to make a left turn across traffic, saw those two lanes of stopped traffic, assumed that meant that the driver in the third lane would be proceeding at a lower, speed of tra uh, lower pace, pulled out, started to make the left turn, and the two crashed into one another. Right? And clearly the driver making the left turn was over-indexing on their experience with what other drivers would do. They were, you know, they were, many human drivers would have been driving at full speed down that road. But also the Uber vehicle wasn't really accounting for the speed of other traffic, wasn't kind of doing the human normal thing, and led to confusion and challenges on the road. And finally, um, example of the Tesla event in Florida, right? And this was a tragic accident. Uh, and in this case, the human self-driving car understanding problem was a little different. In this case, the person who had been driving this car uh, had driven for tens of thousands of miles, believed that he understood the performance envelope of the vehicle, believed that he understood that the vehicle was safe to operate on this road, happened to be in a place where there was a truck could enter the road, did not understand that the self-driving car wasn't able to perceive that vehicle. Uh, and ended up crashing into it, and you know, it was a, a tragic fatality. Um, and so this challenge of how do we ensure that the people in the environment actually understand the intent of the vehicle and that the, the, we are able to close the loop through the technology, through the people, is really going to be the hardest part of what we, you know, we push forward with as, as we push forward with this technology. So where does the future go? There's, two, there's kind of two directions that technology is going to push into. Um, one of them is exemplified by what I think of as the, the Tesla autopilot system, and the other is, is where Google and Aurora and, and others are pushing, driving and riding. So there's a lot of benefit that can be brought with driver assistance systems, um, thoughtfully engineered human interfaces, keeping the driver safer than they are on the road today. Right. For collision mitigation, broadly adopted, will have a tremendous impact on reducing, uh, reducing rear-end accidents, of course. So there's, there's a lot of opportunities there. There's profound opportunities for change by getting the technology to the point where, as SAA would describe it, L4 or L5 technology, where you can sit back and it's really the technology is getting you where you want to go in your day. And so we think about that as riding in the vehicles. And I'm going to focus really on that second part of it. So as Aurora, we, we think about you know, not just what the promise of the technology is, but what we can build as a company. We're pretty convinced we can't compete with Continental and Bosch and all those other folks who know how to do driver assistance. What we do think we can, we can compete and build something interesting for the world is in building that riding side of it, the L4, L5 systems. And so this is just some, some kind of uh, cocktail napkin math. So if you're a, a ride-hailing company today, it costs you somewhere north of $1.60 per mile. And of that $1.60, about 60 cents of it is the vehicle. So the depreciation of the vehicle, maintenance of the vehicle, fuel, all of that, insurance, all that good stuff. And it's about a dollar per mile to pay for the driver. And this may be $2 per mile, but somewhere between $1 and $2 per mile in the US. In the US, there's 3 trillion miles. If instead of paying a dollar per mile for transportation for, for someone to drive the vehicle, you can pay 10 cents per mile because of the automation, that's $300 billion economic opportunity. And this is really the direction this technology is going to push because that's such a profound opportunity. As an automaker, you might look at it this way. So if you look at just Volkswagen's publicly resulted res uh, public um, financial results, it turns out their gross profit for vehicle, if you do the math, is about $4,900. Uh, if, in contrast, they were offer, to offer those vehicles for service, uh, and we look at the opportunity that's in front of them, they're really going to 
replace the cost of two drivers, which is about $70,000 per year. They're going to have to add in the cost of the self-driving technology. Let, let's say when it comes to scale, it's about $10,000. So that means there's about $340,000 worth of value there compared to $5,000. And so this is why this will be profoundly important to the automotive industry. And one of the reasons why this industry, why the self-driving technology part of the business space is, is kind of getting as much attention and energy as it is today. But it's not just about kind of the, the raw economics of this. Obviously in the US, there's about 40,000 people die every year, right? And that's a profound social cost, but it's also a profound economic cost on the, on the country. The cost of traffic accidents, and you guys would know this much better than I do, but in, in rough justice, direct and indirect, it's about a trillion dollars per year on the US economy. And congestion costs are about $150 billion. This technology has the chance to kind of take that tax off of our economy and make the US that much more competitive. For me, it's, it's even more personal than, you know, it, it's, it's kind of, well, it's personal, right? So this is Steve Mann, the gentleman I, I introduced earlier. Um, he's the director of Santa Clara Institute of the Blind. Um, I, I met him a number of times we, uh, over the time that I was at Google. Um, and he's an incredible guy, right? He's an artist. Uh, you know, he runs this not-for-profit. Not um, uh, he's fun to be around. And he happens to be blind, right? And that means that every day it costs him an extra two hours to get wherever he wants to go. Uh, giving him the ability to get around the same way you or I can is, is, is incredible, right? The, just the social good of that is, is important. Um, this is Stephen Fletcher. Stephen Fletcher is the, the brother of the best man at my wedding. Uh, when he was in his 20s, uh, he was driving to a mine site in uh, northern Canada, uh, and he had a moose. Uh, and he was paralyzed, quadriplegic, kind of instantly at that moment. Um, I would like to think if we had this technology, we could have potentially avoided that accident. But in the intervening years, um, he's had an incredible career, right? He's been in politics. He was a cabinet minister in Canada. Um, but throughout that time, again, he's had to rely on others to get around, right? Never had privacy in his vehicle and transportation. Uh, it's never been kind of on demand the way you or I would take it for granted. So giving someone like him back now the mobility and access um, that we have is, again, just incredible. And then even closer to home still for me, this is my family. These are my two boys. Um, uh, the older one is six months away from getting his learner's license. Um, and again, you all know these statistics much better than I do, right? But it's, it's a really bad place to be on the curve. Um, and so if we can get this technology to market, if we can do it thoughtfully and bring it safely out there, um, I don't have to worry about him or his brother. Uh, I won't have to. And many other families won't have to worry about their loved ones either, right? And this is something that um, in our mission, the second word is quickly. Deliver the benefits of self-driving technology safely, quickly, and broadly. And we think about that opportunity to save 1.2 million lives globally by just moving the adoption of this technology forward one year in time. And that's why our people get up every morning and come to work, and that's why we push so hard on what we're doing. 